Minute to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grab some tape. Familiarity. That is our word of the day, ladies and gentlemen. And that is our word of the week. Familiarity. That's the word that comes to mind when I think about this matchup between Georgia and Florida. You are very familiar with your opponent, as you would be with any rival. You are very familiar with this coaching staff. Billy Napier and Kirby Smart worked together in Tuscaloosa. Kirby Smart's last year in Tuscaloosa. Austin Armstrong, the defensive coordinator down there at Florida, worked with Kirby Smart in Athens before heading out to Southern Mississippi. Rob Sale, the offensive line coach at Florida, spent some time in Athens as the offensive line coach. You are very, very familiar with this football coaching staff, and you are very familiar with this particular matchup, right? You can say what you want about these teams year in and year out. They have or they are subject to change, no different than any other college football program or college football matchup that is set in college football in general. They are very subject to week in or year in and year out changes. But this matchup, this matchup has very familiar tendencies year in and year out over the last several decades. Historically, this football game, despite what the units are about, despite what the football teams are about going into this matchup, this football game historically has been about and always will be about the line of scrimmage, okay, and the play at the line of scrimmage and whoever traditionally runs the football the best. You know, I said it a while back on this network, okay, and some of you will remember and some of you will not, okay, that the 4-2 mint, okay, the 4-2 mint defense, it was an innovation in this sport, and it is yours. It is the University of Georgia's. It is your defensive brain trust, okay, Kirby Smart and Glenn Schumann, they were the innovators of a defense that a lot of college football are running nowadays, right? This idea that we are going to play odd front packages out of even front personnel based out of nickel defense, okay? It was not something that you necessarily created, but it's definitely something you innovated, okay, in the sport of college football. And guess what? There are a ton of football programs that are running it nowadays, okay? So when you play a team like Florida, like Georgia is this week, who hang out traditionally, okay, in base personnel in a 4-2-5 mint defense. Not only have you seen it a bunch in practice, okay, but your defense, or, or, or your head coach, rather, is a guy who basically holds the keys to the entire defensive model. So if there is something that stresses him defensively, it will certainly, or most likely, stress the opposition who is trying to run uh, the same defense, right? These football teams are extremely sound on the offensive and defensive side of the football when it comes to schematics, okay? We'll talk about special teams as the week goes on with Florida. It's not great. It's actually cost them some football games, okay? And it's been mainly the, the, the point of emphasis and correction for this football program as, uh, you know, the season has progressed. But when it comes to schematics, these football teams are well coached and they're relatively similar on the defensive side of the football. Um, and I knew this going into today's press conference. I wanted to hear your football coach talk about it because um, I would imagine, like I said, these, this is a 4 2 5 mint front defense, okay? This is a team that tries to emulate themselves to be one day like you are defensively. I was curious what his response would be when asked about this. This was his take on it. Coach, I think a couple weeks ago I asked you about Florida defensively. You said they were similar but not the same. Uh, and when you have a defense that does kind of some stuff that you do, do you ever walk into Coach Bubba's office and be like, hey, look, like this stresses us, or do you ever, you know, I guess have meeting is of the minds. Well, we do that every week. I mean, there's there's a there's a some merit to watching what teams do defensively, and we we get to see the teams in our league on defense as we watch offenses. So you overlap, you know, some with teams, and um, you might you know bring an idea up here or there. But a lot of times, offensively, they they look at things through a different lens. Uh, they look at they, they they they're trying to measure our strengths. Um, and their strengths against each other and our weaknesses and their weaknesses against each other and try to figure that out. But, uh, you know, it doesn't – you can get too caught up in the, the scheme, I think, a lot of times. 
this game boils down to you know physicality, line of scrimmage, team that can rush the ball, team that tackles well, team that doesn't turn it over, uh, and those don't have to do with uh, with schemes. Yeah, you heard him talk about it right there, right? It's not about getting wrapped up in schematics. It's about who's going to block the best, who's going to tackle the best. Um, that is true. That is 100% true. It is still football, right? Football in its, uh, you know, it's very complex, but in its uh, ultimate, like, like very simplistic terms, it's about who blocks and who tackles, right? Who blocks the best and who tackles the best every Saturday normally wins the football games. He's not wrong there. Um, but I find it hard to believe that going into this football game, Georgia will not have a uh, or not have access to a very unique uh, asset and resources with regards to ways to stress this defense, right? This Austin Armstrong defensive coordinator has been cultivated and touched by people around him with regards to football knowledge. Well, one of those people around him is Kirby Smart. So if there are answers to the test, okay, he got to those answers through proxy and, and, and through osmosis of being around somebody like Kirby Smart. So if I know how that guy is predicated, okay, if I know how he's going to respond to certain things, I probably have a leg up and I probably have a unique advantage. You know who, they el who else they had a very unique and similar advantage against uh, the last time with someone with regards to a defense that is trying to be this similar to who they are at their core? It was Oregon. And they had a pretty daggum good game plan against Oregon, okay, last year when they played them. That was the last defense that I've seen where I walk in on by, I watch them on tape, and I'm like, oh, you're trying to be almost a carbon copy of what Georgia does. And when that happens, well, you know, the guy who kind of created the defense might have some answers to how to solve it. Hey, welcome into tonight's show. We got a loaded one for you. It is Monday, okay, so that does mean What's well, every other Monday, every third Monday, depending on how the man's schedule works. It means we got our guy, Aaron Murray, with us tonight. We also, about 30 minutes with our boy Murray coming up here in just a few. Uh, we're going to uh, give him three today. My bad, that was on me. I left it today in there. We got an injury report from this morning in Kirby Smart's press conference. I'm going to give you the latest uh, on the word on the street coming out of Athens regarding Brock Bowers. I know everybody's worried and wondering about that one still. Uh, Cedric Van Pran Granger continues to be one of my guys and one of our guys here on this network. We're going to show you a clip from today's press conference that to me, I think, kind of encapsulates what it means to be a Georgia football player, okay? What it means to be buttoned up in all of the areas required to approach your job as a football player professionally. We're going to give you some of that today because I think it was some gold from our guy, SVP. And I not only have a concept of the day, I have concepts of the day. I feel like a lot of the time on this network and a lot of the time the analysis is very uh, centric on offensive football, trying to explain why things are working offensively you're a defensive-based program, okay, you're an offensive-led football team this year, but you are a defensive-led football program historically. I'm going to show you what you're doing defensively this year just in terms of coverage because um, I think sometimes, hey, what is cover six? What is cover three? What's cover one robber look like, Brooks? I'm going to show you what that looks like today. So make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you're liking, subscribing, rate, and reviewing. If you're watching us, make sure you're listening to us over on Spotify and iTunes, Apple Podcasts. However, wherever you catch a podcast, we are available, okay? So make sure you're going over there, subscribing, uh, hitting that uh, review, leaving us a five-star review, all that good stuff. If you're listening to us today, make sure you're running over to YouTube and subscribing to that platform as well and leaving a comment over there. Boys, how are we doing today on this fine Monday? Good. Nice and rejuvenated after the yeah, bye for week. for real. Ready for the great pilgrimage. So I, I know what I did this bye week. My, my, my bye week was surrounded around a, a, a friend of my wife's wedding. We'll get to that here in a second. What did you guys do on, on your bye week? I went and experienced Gatlinburg for the first time. You sound super excited about that. That sounds like an off-season plan for your, your uh, soon-to-be wife. She's like, we're getting out of town. You're going to spend some time with me, huh? Yeah, you know, bye week's the one weekend where we get to hang out for the whole weekend, so I took advantage of that. Neither one of us have been to Gatlinburg, and we both came away with the same conclusion. Glad we went. Really wouldn't want to go back. Last time I was in Gatlinburg, half of the forest was burned down. It was fresh mm, after a fire. Nice. Um, what did you do with your bye week there, Kurt? So I woke up at about 10 a.m., which was very nice. Nice, and nice. And after doing daily routine and everything, at about noon, sat down on the couch. Ooh. And for the next 12 hours, I watched college football. Oh, you mainline football, huh? It was the best, dude. Oh, I, dude. I haven't had a real opportunity all season because you're, you're usually going to the games. You have to cover yeah. them, so... To be able to sit down and just watch the games, not to worry about anything else. I'm envious. Very of you. nice. I'm envious of you. I, I had that until about three thirty. 
And then, well, it's about four o'clock. And then after that, we were here watching the three TV set up until about four o'clock. And then as soon as four o'clock hit, we had to start getting ready for the widest wedding I've ever been to. Mm. Like I've been to a lot, lot of uh, just dripped in caucasity weddings. Um, this was something new. Here's how you knew off rip, super white. Uh, destination wedding, and we were just there for a reception. So they just invited their closest friends to Athens to celebrate the fact that they got married several months ago, way off in some pretty place in the mountains that just looks good for photos, didn't invite anybody, basically annulled and got married. So that's the one thing. But here was the widest thing I've ever seen. You know what a mosh pit is, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. A mosh pit at a wedding reception was something I, I never thought in my life I would see. I'm, all, I'm not really all for Screamo, kind of against it, honestly, think it's like, whoa. As soon as it turns it on, I got questions about the person I'm with. I'm like, damn, you got some demons, huh, cuz? Um, but to watch a mosh pit go down, and here was the craziest part, gentlemen. The mosh pit happened. The, 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 uh, the guy who got married, what do you call that guy? The groom? the groom? The groom successfully got through the mosh pit as the leader of said mosh pit with the suit jacket button still buttoned. Mm. It was honestly one of the so more was, impressive things I've seen. So was the mosh pit weak or was it just? Nobody hit the floor. Okay, so nobody hit the deck. Now, I, I don't know much about mosh pits. Now, I'm not a mosh pit savant, okay? As someone who, you know, grew up almost exclusively listening to hip hop and R&B, um, not necessarily a mosh pitter. This seemed like a relatively decent mosh pit though. What mm. song was playing? I couldn't tell you. It was some there's some of that going on. Sounds like chop suey. Chop suey? Sounds like it. Basically. So my off, my, my off week was spent, you know, hanging out with some receptions. Um, thoughts thoughts on, a, on a destination wedding and thoughts on the idea of we're going to have a reception for everybody who didn't get to go to the destination wedding. Come celebrate us. I was close to doing it. Yeah? Yeah. Then we kind of met halfway in between of where it's semi-destination, but yeah. not really. But we still want people to be there. But so here, here's the tip that I will give anybody that has this type of setup. Because I, I understand. You don't want the stressful day of a, a, of a wedding day. You just want to have the party. I get it. It's a very you-centric thing. Um, if you're going to do this, if you are, make sure there is TVs available. Because you are occupying a Saturday. Let's not, be on, let's, not be, let's not lie about this, okay? Let's make sure TV is available. Definitely an open bar. That was a solid suggestion and a, and a solid execution by this couple. Um, but definitely make sure the food is good, okay? Because if you're basically inviting us for dinner, make sure I'm eating a good dinner. You know what I mean? So there you go. Was the food uh, good? What? Was the food good? Yeah, food was good. I, I mean, I had a good time. I'm not going to lie. Did even you, though, you know, you it, wasn't even, it wasn't even about me and all that good stuff. But I had a good time. Did you mosh? No, I did not mosh. I sat there and watched. Lame. Um, but I am probably like... Super, first time I've been to a wedding and just sweated out the white shirt because um, I got after it. I got after it on the dance floor. Um, I, obviously, most of the people that listen to the show, they know I, I went sober like eight months ago. Um, so events like this are rather, not necessarily stressful for me, but they're not like they used to be. Used to be they were a good time to get hammered and have a good time and dance on the dance floor. This time, I just kind of threw caution in the wind um, and, and, and got after it anyways. And uh, yeah, we pit bar barbecued through a, through a white tee. So it was nice. good. Nice. And I can't wait to read the comments about, hey, why are they talking about wedding receptions? Shut up. Um, appreciate you. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. Is Murray there? With Not us? yet. Not with us. Murray's showing up when he wants to, as per usual. Um, that's fine with me. Uh, where, where, where should we go in the meantime while we're waiting on Murray? Should we talk about this injury report? Yeah, yeah. let's go. Let's, let's do this right it. quick. Um, I'm going to text him, make sure he's coming. Uh, let's do this injury report right quick. Uh, obviously, people want to know about Brock. We'll get to him later. Uh, it sounds like Roger Robinson's going to be back this week. Sounds like he was practicing in full last week. and sounds like he's going to give it a go this week. And I think that's very important for a matching of pace standpoint with Kendall. I think those two are very similar runners, and you can give them a, a little bit of a change up in terms of like Dejon's definitely going to be the primary ball carrier moving forward. Uh, but it sounds like you're going to get Roger Robinson back this week. Uh, it looks like we got Murray in. Let's go ahead and patch our guy in there. Obviously, he is Aaron Murray. He is the leading uh, passer. Uh, in the SEC for now, and it looks like he's going to hold on to that with Will Rogers having a little bit of a shoulder injury out there at Mississippi State. Murray, how are we doing today, baby? Man, I'm so happy Mike Wright's playing quarterback there at Mississippi State. Just, <laughs> just hell yeah. Uh, I apologize. I forgot to put my 
my makeup on. My little daughter scratched the crap out of me yesterday, so I got to cut the nails. I can't even see. Uh, I've only got point. you on audio, but I'm sure you look handsome, dude. You always do. Uh, I look a little rough. I look a little rough. I got the wife beat my butt, but it's okay. She does. I kind of like it's it. All good. Hey, you were doing yeah. this show out on a on a porch uh, with with the, some some crickets in the background. I see you back in the office now, huh? We back in the office. We we away from the lake. Uh, I I got the next couple of weekends off, so I may be back in the lake here soon. But um, yeah, it's weird. I like my my schedule's been crazy. I had I had a Wednesday game last week. Then I had a Saturday game. Then I got another Wednesday game this week. Then I got some action next Tuesday. Uh, so like my days are just all over the damn place. But uh, blessed to be having as many jobs as you like to say as I do. Yeah, I mean, I texted you afterwards. You were you were complaining last week. Oh, I got a game tomorrow. Boo hoo. Woe is me. Mm -hmm. um, come on, we're we're available. We'll throw them. You can throw them my way. Um, no, what is it? What is a win? Who you got this week on a Wednesday night football game? Who you got? Uh, this week, God, I gotta I gotta continue to remind myself who I actually have because it's all blends together. I got UTEP at Sam Houston. Delightful. Mm. At Sam Houston. So, so I'm going to be mm. out there in, in, in Houston. Mm. Uh, a good mm. little – do they at least fly – are you flying coach? What, what, what we got? I thought you were going to say like flying private. Like, no, I'm – my. You, know, you get what you get. You know, I ain't, I ain't Herb Street here. You know, you take what you can get. You you get the flights early. You get in there. You move your, you know, move your seat around. Hopefully get like an exit seat. It's always the goal. All right, let's talk football. We talked familiarity to start the show. Just the idea, hey, there's a lot of crossover, particularly defensively uh, with this football team in Florida and this football team in Georgia. Obviously, Austin Armstrong got a well, uh, a well-versed background mm -hmm. with Kirby having had work for him. Uh, Billy Napier, some crossover there at, at Alabama, obviously offensive mind himself. But when you have a defense like this in Florida that schematically is very, fairly similar to what you do at your core uh, as a defensive mind, how much of uh, you know Kirby walking into Bobo's office you think is going on this week, if any? Well, I don't even know if it's just that. I mean, I don't even think Bobo needs it. He sees that def that defense every single day of practice. Yeah. Like he goes against it. He went. He was there last year. Uh, obviously, he saw what Munkin would scheme up. I mean, because that's what you do in spring. Like you have some fun. Like you try and create big plays against your defense. You try to create some explosions. You, it, it's us versus them. And, and Kirby's the best at it of creating that competition every single day in, in the offseason and fall camp and obviously during the season as well. So, like, Bobo knows the strengths and weaknesses of, of the defense and the pressure points. And, and, and maybe Kirby can clarify a couple things here or there of, of yeah, this, this can stress the defense out here or this motion or this shift or this, you know, putting a, a, a formation into the boundary, whatever you want to do. Yeah. But I think Bobo will have a, a clear understanding of, of what needs to be done come Saturday. Yeah, he seems to be pretty uh, well-versed at attacking each individual opponent based off what they do. Um, I, I'm curious, this, and I was kind of texting you about this before. Um, Georgia obviously created an offense that was, I mean, it's based off tight end personnel the last couple of years, but it's mm -hmm. really based off their ability to kind of stress defenses with the unique ability of Brock Bowers. Um, you played with a guy who was very uniquely gifted as well in A.J. Green, who I would, I would imagine kind of played a role or at least influenced the offense that you guys designed during his time uh, at the University of Georgia. And then all of a sudden, hey, he goes out, he's suspended. Now, it's obviously not an injury, it's a suspension. But you guys created an offense that I would imagine was somewhat around or predicated to the abilities of AJ, and then you don't have him. So I'm curious, during that time and that changeup of like, oh shit, now we got to create a kind of a new style of offense like mm -hmm. he's having to do now. What, what was Mike Bobo like in those in, in that situation back well, in the day? And I think the biggest difference is <clears throat> the offense went around, obviously, the run game and then receivers. And A.J. obviously being a receiver, like nothing schematically changed. Yeah. You know, we we just substituted Chris Durham in there or, or Tavares King. And, and those guys, we ran the same plays. The difference now with Brock Bowers is, like you said, like it is a unique offense because it, it, it's, it's a different personnels. You know, you're not just in, you know, what we were in mostly 21 personnel or 11 personnel. Yeah. You know, what Georgia does now is a lot of the 12 personnel. You know, it forces defenses to kind of figure out, as you know, like, you know, do you say base? Do you go do you go nickel? Um, how do you handle a guy like Brock Bowers? And then kind of where you move him in the offense. So, like, having that chess piece to me is a bigger loss schematically than losing A.J. Green. Hmm. A hundred percent. Because A.J. was, you know, listen, we, A.J. in our in our two-by-two, Played to the field. Uh, three by one, you, you played to the boundary. If I had AJ matched up backside, I'm going to take that matchup. 
Um, if he was one on one to the field, I'm gonna take it. Like it was, it wasn't nothing crazy. Like Brock, yeah. you can just do so much more with. And like you alluded to, like this offense has built, been built around Brock Bowers for two and a half years now. So I think it's a, a much bigger hit to this football team than than us losing AJ back in 2010 for four I, games. I think what you just explained was having a dominant, and this is just kind of overboard, like a, a overarching statement about football in general. If you have a dominant X receiver. It really simplifies the read. It doesn't necessarily change the concepts. It just makes the reads a whole hell of a lot easier, right? Oh, one-on-one, easy answer, we go there. Whereas if you have a dynamic tight end, it really impacts the conceptual design of what you're actually doing offensively, like we've seen uh, at Georgia. But well, so I, I, I do think the thing you can do with a tight end that's different from a receiver yeah. is you get a lot more keys to the quarterback. Yeah. Like I know based on certain formations where I put Brock Bowers – is it man or is it zone? Yeah. Like you don't always know that with receivers unless, unless you, you know, say you wanted to put AJ green in the slot. And if they had a, a star corner that you knew that that guy was going to shadow AJ the entire time and man, okay, that guy came over. It's man. Well, for, for, for an offense, if, if you go like a zero by three formation, so tight end stays backside three receivers, to the front side and say, I flex Brock out. Mm-hmm. Well, if a corner stays backside, most of the time that's zone. If corners travel, and there's a backside safety or, or, or linebacker that stays on Brock, well, then I know as a quarterback, okay, it's a man situation. Yeah. And, and so those are the little tells you get with a guy like Brock that does help the processing of a quarterback. All right. I hate to do this, but Georgia is one in nine. This is your stat from today, Kirby. So mm. shouts out to I, you. Here. I got a bunch of them. Georgia quarterbacks are one in nine since mm. 2000 in their mm. first career starts. So – before against I Florida. give you the rundown, what? Against Florida. Against Florida, excuse me. When I give you the rundown, I, I, we'll, 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 we have the, uh, the, the actual stat reference from this football game today. What do you remember about your first start against Florida, Mr. Murray? <clears throat> first start. Um, I will always remember that first snap. You, know, you look up as a quarterback and it's like, bam, 50-50. And like the Texas-Oklahoma thing's cool. It's the other way around. and it, It's it's. You know, a little bit harder when you get to certain end zones, but yeah. like being able to look down the middle of a goalpost and see red and black and, and orange and blue and, and be the quarterback in that situation is is something that I always will forever remember that moment. Um, I remember playing like crap for a good majority of it, a couple too many turnovers, had some big explosive plays. Uh, I do remember a little 145 angel with a, a backside post from Tavares King for, for a big touchdown that got us going back in the game. Uh, and then uh, I think I had a running either a two-point play or a touchdown later that sent us to overtime. And then I'll say this. We talk about force-feeding players. Yeah. I'm not going to call Bobo out here, but I guess <laughs> this is someone calling Bobo out. It was a three-by-one play. And Bobo kind of – I'm a freshman. And, like, in these moments, like, kind of what Ohio State did. Like, hey, an experienced quarterback, feed Marvin Harrison Jr. Hey, yeah. Aaron, you know, you've been up and down this game. Just throw the ball to AJ. Just throw to AJ. Well, if I would have gone by my rules, TK is running a bench route backside where if safety rotates to the middle of the field, you just rip the bench off coverage, easy 12-hour completion. I'm a young freshman. Coach says throw to AJ. I'm going to throw to AJ. And uh, ball gets picked. Late pick, too. Sealed it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. Didn't seal it. It was overtime. Uh... Threw the pick. I chased his ass down and laid him out. <laughs> which forced them to have to make the field goal. They made the field goal when it was their turn, and they won the football game. First but, play um, of the game was an interception, though, right? Damn, why are we being up so negative right now? <laughs> <laughs> we ain't got to bring all – I already let you know that I had. I didn't have my best game. It was my first time there, but come on. <laughs> Dude, I looked it up in the box score today, and I see John Brantley versus freshman Aaron Murray, and quite yeah. honestly – well, I'm glad I missed the football game. <laughs> it was actually it was a really a, good game. It was actually a really was good, a good game. game. Down to the wire, overtime game. matchup. Did have yeah. a successful drive with like four minutes left in the game <clears> to tie it up. He was right on that. Had seven play drive. I think it's 43 total yards. Yeah. Big time clutch drive there at the end of the game. Yeah. Out of, you know, out and of, our boy, our boy Carson's from Jacksonville. So, you know, he's going to be, you know, trying to show up for the hometown, hometown sure. kids, you know, fans and, and mom, dad, and friends and all that. Uh, you know, I always remember this. Like, I'm from Florida too. So, yeah. I got a ton of like h- half my school went to Florida State from high school, and Orson can to attest to this. And then half our school went to to Florida. So like the night before the game, the entire week, man, my phone was just blown up from my boys back home. Like 
you know, either my Florida State buddies saying like kick their ass or my Florida fans, my buddies, you know, talking that smack. So that was always kind of fun heading into those games for me. No, absolutely. I mean, I couldn't imagine being a kid from Florida. I mean, we, we kind of talked to you about your decision to end up coming to Georgia. Um, obviously, Florida had uh, Tebow at the wrapping up Tebow at the time and mm -hmm. uh, the, the Cam Newton sweepstakes. And it just didn't feel right necessarily for you. And then I, I believe it was Bobo. I mean, Brantley was a high, Brantley was a high, highly recruited kid too. I mean, yeah. they were loaded the quarterback room. Yeah, um, and then obviously Mike Bobo. I think it was you that told us Mike Bobo having had played at Georgia was a, mm -hmm. a, a major kind of selling point for you going to Georgia, was it not? Yeah, I mean having having Bobo who's been there, and I think that was the biggest selling point for me was was you know couple things but i think the offensive scheme i wanted to be a part of that more pro style offense yeah i wasn't tebow i wasn't camp like the yeah. thought of me running the ball 15 times a game and getting beat up in the sec just really was not appealing to me and then then obviously dan mullen was leaving like there was it was writing on the wall dan mullen yeah. was going to take a head coaching job here soon so like you are committing to university but you're also committing to a coaching staff and not knowing who is going to be calling the plays for florida plus a stacked room just didn't really feel good. And then, and then, like you alluded to, Bobo and his experience at Georgia, his knowledge of the playbook, also Coach Rick being a former play caller as well, yeah. the success that Coach Rick has a play caller, all that kind of played in the decision to, um, to leave the state of Florida, which was, it, listen, it wasn't easy. Like, it was a very tough decision. And I, I will always remember my dad sitting me down saying, listen, if you go to Georgia, you're not going to want to come back to Florida. Um, it's just you're just not gonna want to like you're not gonna and it didn't make sense to me at the time because I was like I'm eight seventeen years old yeah and I was like you know what if I want to come live in Tampa Dad then damn it I'll come live in Tampa <laughs> like you don't know that like I'll be fine I I tell people all the time like I would love to live in Tampa I miss the water I miss the the weather all that stuff I'd be a damn idiot to leave Atlanta idiot to leave and go down the, the enemy territory so now I kind of understand what he said but still wouldn't trade it for the world man. No, nah, I, I totally, uh, I totally get it there. I don't understand because obviously, you know, just Division Two football player. But I, I couldn't imagine um, the, the the decision to leave the state of Florida um, and then play at, like you said, your your high school was a half Florida State, half UF uh, school, and then to be a five star and end up going to Georgia. I'm sure you heard about that for quite some time. Where where did I want to go next? I, I know one thing. He's going to nail Murray trivia here in a little bit. It sounds mm -hmm. like he's got some kind of recall. Um, how long have you had a all recall like this, Murray? You know, it's all quarterbacks. We got great recall. No, not all of yes. you. That's most, not true. Most. Not all of you. Some of you are a little like, airheaded. You just throw the ball really well. Okay, so yeah. let's not let's not. But I'm not the far. one that throws the ball really well, so I had to have re good recall. That's I'm glad point. you said it. I get shit on all the time where I'm like, hey, yeah. yo, Murray, Murray, not one of these dudes. It's got like one of these futuristic arms. Just no, a good decision God, maker. No. Listen, you know, that, that was the hard part for me, too. When, when, when I got to Georgia and and I would battle every day versus Met, you know, it was Met versus me. And Met's a – dude, Met has that arm. Met's, Met's the six opposite. Five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Met and I are the complete opposite. Like, I'm the – you know, I'm, I was the film junkie. I was the weight room junkie. I was the, you know, the details, all the, the X's and O's. And Met was just so gifted. And not saying, like, Met didn't know his stuff. Like, Met was was intelligent, too. Um, but, like, that was my my strength. And his strength was I'm 6'5 and can throw the ball 80 yards on a rope. So, like, that was always hard for me every day going against practice and seeing how effortless it was for him yeah. and uh, and how hard I had to try at times to try to keep up with, with what he could do. Yeah, Met was 6'5, right? 6'6, 230 pounds. And then comes freshman Murray. What'd you, what'd you measure in at freshman year? 5'11 and three quarters? Wow. 185 pounds? Wow. Wow. Uh no, I'm six one. <laughs> I was about man. 210, oh, 215. Oh my god, he did it again. I gave it up. 210, 215. Bad. That's on me. 210, 215, baby. Your hey. boy was lifting. I was lifting with the linebackers my freshman year, which is uh, not a bragging thing. Probably more of a stupidity thing because I was benching way too much weight uh, to be a quarterback. I was like 325 repping it out. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What we got nowadays? Because I know you're still working out. No, I don't. I don't lift weights really. No chance. Strictly no chance. yoga and cardio. Yeah, guy. I. If I get too tight up in the chest, just like it hurts a quarterback, it hurts the golf swing. I need flexibility. Uh, 
So like I ain't trying to script the golf game. So just enough to to keep some definition. Murray's the only father of a young child with the work schedule that he has, who owns a bit a portion of a business that has time to play fucking golf. Sorry. That's two. Oh That's two. my god, bro. That's two. Sorry. It's rare it's just, that I play golf. You I play golf. I, I usually play when I'm on the road. Yeah. I'll sneak I'll sneak around on the road. That's the, you know why? Because that's guilt free. I don't know if the wife the wife definitely doesn't listen to this show. Yours definitely doesn't. That's guilt free. That's why. Because you ain't got to ask. You just get to go, mm-hmm. right? I don't even think she knew that I played golf this past weekend on Friday. So I'm gonna send it to so her. So does it know? Um, <laughs> hey, we, one in nine. Do you know the the quarterback who won his first starting as Florida? Greeny? No. One more Shock. guess. Shock. Nope, it was Jake Fromm. Shouts out to the oh, Fromster. Nice. That a boy, Jake. Yep, absolutely. Hey, um, keys to the matchup this weekend, Murray, before we let you go and play. Or actually, before we let you go, we're definitely mm. playing Murray Trivia. Keys mm. to the matchup this weekend, buddy. Keys to the matchup. Uh, you know, I, I want to see Carson have a big game. You know, I, I think that there's – this is a huge opportunity for him. Yeah. It's It's – it's crazy. Like all these great quarterbacks this year. And we talk about like this great quarterback draft class. And I still think it is like, I, I still think Drake's a really good quarterback. Obviously we, you know, I, I, I love what Caleb's capable of doing, but Carson can work his way into the first round. If he wants to, like he is, he is to me, he has all the measurables, great size, incredible arm strength, accurate with the football, a uh, good decision maker, and has shown the ability to run at times. Like, what what can't Carson do that doesn't show him that he's a first round draft pick other than maybe he hasn't played enough games? So I think this is an opportunity for him to show the country and, and NFL scouts that I can truly shoulder the burden of a football team and go out there and dominate without the crutch of, of saying that, you know, Brock Bowers is still the guy that I rely on. So I want to see him. I'm a big fan of him. I know you guys know that. Yeah. I want to see him go out there and do his thing, take care of the football as always you know, play smart. It's an emotional game. Like there's a reason why, you know, Georgia quarterbacks are one and nine. Like, you know, a lot of those were against good Florida teams, but it's a rivalry game. Weird things happen. You get emotional, especially when you're from the state of Florida. Can he just play poised and take care of the game and not, and just let it come to him. That's my number one key. Uh, and then defensively, just don't let Florida get going, run the football. Yeah. Plain and simple. Like you, you can't let Montreal Johnson and ETN get going. It's not a good offensive line. You have to put the ball in the Graham Mertz's hands in long down situations and force him to be a passer. If you do that, I, I think Georgia will have a field down defense. Super counter heavy and mis- misdirection run game from Florida. So um, classic eyes right football game. I want to talk about something you just hit on there. Um, talking about Carson potentially being a first round draft pick. Um, why this year? Why not next year? Because I mean, here, here's my thing, Murray. We've been talking about this and you talk. Oh, I would love for him to stay for another year. This I, is, this I, I is know. A personal I, I'm more. I'm more talking about. I don't think it's feasible that he will come out this year because of. Now he's playing well, but in if the NFL and we've been talking about on this network, the NFL has been like very obvious and outspoken about these one-year college starters mm-hmm. and how afraid they are of this now um, moving forward because of the way the history has gone recently with guys like Mac Jones, guys like uh, Trey Lance. Guys yep. like Anthony Richardson, all these guys that only have Mitch Trubisky, all these guys that have 13, 14 college starts and not a large enough sample size. These NFL guys are really scared. But beside that point, right now, today, where would you put him in this class? Because this What's class up? does have Caleb Williams, Drake May, Quinn Ewers, Michael Penix, um, Sam Hartman. Oh, J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy. There's a lot of well, names. J.J. might come back too, though. J.J.'s only a junior. J.J. could come back. Man, he must really love Jim Harbaugh if that's the case. I, I, I he's he's got all the traits like, and tools, man. Yeah, no, I agree. I like JJ a lot. Like, I think there's two guys to me that that have a legit chance to win the Heisman. It's JJ, and if Jaden Daniels wins in Tuscaloosa and beats Georgia, I think Jaden gets the trophy. But like J, JJ McCarthy has elevated his game incredibly. Yeah. I mean, if if I if you put all those quarterbacks in there, like like these are guys I would consider first round talent. You know, Caleb. Drake, um, Michael Penix. I think you put JJ in there, possibly Carson. You know, if Shadur did decide to come out, you know, you throw him in there. I, I still would put Carson third. Hmm. I put him after. I would put him after Drake, and I put him after uh, Caleb. I put him ahead of Penix. That's gonna sound like a hot take, but the people that it, like, because we know we've seen him throw it, and I think we're a little bit. Uh, 
He's a better thrower than, yeah, than we're, Penix we're, is we're, great, we're, man. We're Penix is by, really that's, good. That's what I was trying to say. We're swayed by this fact that we've seen this dude throw, and we know where he's at in terms of like an NFL. I mean, arm. where would most people put him? Like, he's you're not going to put him above or below. I don't think you put him below JJ. You're definitely not putting him below Bo Nix. Mm. I mean, he's anywhere from three to five, which is a top two round draft pick. All right, what about him versus Jaden Daniels? Oh, I'm taking him. And from, I love Jaden. From Jayden, an NFL perspective? From an NFL's perspective, he, yeah. he projects way better than Jaden NFL-wise. And and, and Jaden may have a good good career, man. Like Jaden's improved throwing the football tremendously. Like I said, I think Jaden, to me, if he takes care of business, is going to win the Heisman. But I would still take Carson as a pro prospect over him. Man, you really – you been he been on the LSU tank. He been in that bandwagon since the spring game, though. He I have called that one. Hey, you can't tell me that's not the best offense in the country right now. No, you're right. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not arguing with you. I just they do have a chance to beat Alabama because they can score. Yes. Um. But you, I'm sure you've studied that Alabama defense. That Alabama defense. This oh, they're year nasty, is just, bro. They're as good as any defense they've ever had. That, I would that front argue. four. That number fifty. What's his name? That defensive tackle. That dude was all over the place. Uh, this past weekend 50 41 the linebacker is yeah. a freak oh um, yeah like squirrel white had that great play dude that that linebacker was step for step with the fastest wide receiver in the sec I um I like yeah. i love that defense but i yeah. still lean when you have that that many weapons and and great offense beats great defense over great the offense beats great defense especially with it when you have a quarterback that's run for over 600 yards absolutely like what do you want to do like you don't have enough DBs to cover them, and if you do try to play coverage, Jaden's a great runner, and then Diggs is running the ball well too. So I, I don't. I, I think they could score in the 30s versus Alabama, which is still, I would say, a good defense a day. Yeah. And I don't care how bad LSU's defense is. Like, can Alabama's offense score that many points consistently this year? I just don't know if I trust them just yet. I mean, I know you do the show with uh, T. Bob, so you're probably watching a little bit more LSU football. How quiet has Mason Smith been this year? Yeah. I mean, no, defense. nowhere, nowhere to be seen. But even as like a defensive tackle, like if he's playing on a shitty defense, he should at least flash. I don't feel like we've seen that. It, even as a freshman, you turn the tape on, you're like, okay, mm-hmm. zero, zero is a great football player. Um, don't feel like we've seen that. All right, let's play a little bit of Murray trivia because I think you're going to nail these. Um, I only have two for you. You have four 400-yard passing games in your career. Do you know mm. which ones they are? Mm. Mm, four 400-yard passing games in four my career. Four 400-yard passing games. Give me years. All right. One of them was in 2012. The rest of them were in 2013. Hmm. Damn, I had, 13, I had three and 13. One of, these, dude, one of these you threw for 427 yards on 18 completions. It mathematically makes no sense. Holy smokes. That was a 12-year? No, that was 13. Oh. You're left, by the way, I was telling the guys this. I, I struck you as one has to be who, versus Kentucky. So yeah, one, one of them is Kentucky in 2012. That's, that's 2012. Games versus Kentucky. That's yep. always has to be games versus Kentucky. You scorched Kentucky at Kroger Field in 2012. Okay. Um, I would think the 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 game versus Auburn in the last year because that was like a massive second half. Like we were down 20 points and we were throwing All the right. crap out of it. So you got the UK. You got the at Auburn in 2013. You had two more of these in 2013. I don't know. Oh, actually, one of them was in 2012. It was actually in a bowl game. So there's a little hint. For mm, Nebraska game. There yeah. you go. That was, that was Nebraska. Dude, that was how, MVP game. How, how do you have 18 completions and throw for 427? That game, I know we start off like TK had a post for like 70 yards that I underthrew, and he did a good job kind of shielding the, the defender off. Um, that was just a big game. Bobo we'll just let that thing fly. I would have thrown for a bunch of yards versus Kentucky my senior year if I didn't get hurt. I was rolling that game. I don't know the fourth one, though. Oh, I think – let me guess. Was it North Texas? It was North Texas. Hey, yeah. I don't know who was on North Texas' staff and why Mark Rick was trying to hang up some hundos. Well, that was that was when he had that uh, 98-yard yeah, pass to Reggie, to Reggie Davis. Davis. Yeah, so, that helps. Yeah. So you know what else helps when you do like a Georgia podcast and a show like this? Is to have two actual like students and fans with you because like I'm I'm ignorant to all of this. Well, you know, um, like Murray's time as quarterback was when like at least for me like that's when I started watching Georgia football. So, like that's like you're my in diapers? memories of Georgia. No, he wasn't diapers? quite in diapers, but he was in middle school. No, nah, yeah, I was like 11, 12. Yeah, you're not that old, Murray. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> you're not that old, Murray. You're oh. just kind of old. Oh. <laughs> hey, yeah. what all do you need to promote right now? Because I know you got a bunch. So go ahead and rattle it off. 
Oh man. Well, obviously if you want to get some 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 player content, uh Javon and Meeks did a great show where they kind of broke down what they're they expecting for um for the game this weekend. So excited to see that one. Or it's out now, so make sure you go check out the players lounge. Uh and then tomorrow night uh we'll do a Letterman breakdown live breakdown show. It'll be me, Brandon Boykin, Ben Jones, No Sean Marino, hopefully with a shirt on this time. Uh and then Tavares King. Yeah, last week he did it from a beach somewhere on vacation. I didn't think he was going to come on. I sent the link to our group, and he jumps on, and he's hammered drunk, shirt off, going in. It was awesome. It was hilarious. I'm in a fight, and I'm hammered yeah, drunk. Uh, <laughs> uh, us five will be uh, kind of you know talking ball, our time, our memories from the Florida game, and then you know kind of some expectations heading into this weekend as well. So uh, a lot of great stuff, uh, a couple other player shows. we got a baseball show rolling. we got a softball show rolling. Uh, and I think Makai and, and – uh, Jacob right now are, are filming a show that will come out later this week as well, talking about the game this weekend. Just all kinds of dog content over there on the Players' Lounge. Make sure you're signing up over there on the it's playerslounge.io, correct? Playerslounge.io. Look at me, just out here ripping plugs like mm. I'm a professional. Hey, Murray, for real, I appreciate you for coming on every so often when you have an opportunity to, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Always love talking ball with you. No doubt. We'll talk soon, bud. That is Aaron Murray. Um, still one of the, I always say it when we have him and Terrence on, still one of the cooler things that we've been able to do on this network. For real? Um, I yeah. started covering Georgia in March of 2019. I had 400 followers on Twitter. And I honestly, it was very, very, da- it was like overwhelming how like far I had to go. Um, and I, I remember listening to like when I first got introduced to the market and like got the job, I was like, well, first thing I'm going to do, because I was a big podcast guy at the time. Like, I'm going to search to find the biggest Georgia podcast I can. And I found uh, Jamie's podcast, and I found, obviously, B.A.'s podcast, um, the OG B.A. I know some people call me B.A. I reserve that right for Brandon Adams until he retires or whatever. Um, he is the OG B.A. And I would remember listening to those podcasts, and I would just think, man, it's like, no way. No, no way. Like, we have so far to go. And here we are, four years later, and uh, two of, not arguably, two of the greatest Georgia football players come on this network every week and just dick around with us. And I think that is awesome. That is so cool to me. Pretty sweet. I mean, like I just said, Aaron Murray's like the first quarterback that we really watched as kids. And so, like, if you would have told 12-year-old me, like, hey, 10 years from now, you'll be chopping it up with Aaron Murray on a weekly ba- – or at biweekly basis. Like, yeah. never would have thought. Yeah, make sure you emphasize the biweekly yeah. there. That's one of my Sometimes favorite – Sometimes triweekly – that's one of my favorite like moments with Murray. It's like, oh yeah, man, we'll do it. We'll do it every other week. We'll do it home and home. I'll come out there. I'll come out there to your studio. Some bitch drove out here one time and was like, nah, zoom it is. Or 10 a.m. <laughs> zoom it is. Yeah, 10 a.m. Had to hire a third producer to come in here just to get Murray in on Mondays. But we got him. So that is pretty dope. So shouts out to Aaron Murray for joining us every single other week here on the network, depending on whether or not he's calling UAB in Memphis and Birmingham. <laughs> that sounds like fun, man. Yeah, it does sound like fun. Hey, Birmingham, you ought to drive through it at night one time. I don't know why, but you ought to drive through it at night sometime because the uh, their version of 285, their version of 85, their version of 75, when you go through Birmingham, they all have a version of Spaghetti Junction out yeah. there as mm-hmm. well. Their Spaghetti Junction has uh, lights mm-hmm. all the way underneath the bridge, all the way through the town. So when you drive through during Halloween, it's Halloween covered. When you drive through during Pride Month, it's a rainbow. When you drive through during Christmas, it's green and red. It's pretty dope. Um, don't know how much money they spent on it. During the day, it looks like dog shit because there's a bunch of lights underneath the bridge randomly. But at night, Beeham, beautiful city. Hmm. Probably one you don't want to be out in the streets in at night, though. So, But, but drive through them, look through them real pretty. Uh, Beeham. Shouts yeah, out, Aaron Murray. Been to Beeham a couple of times. Yeah, Beeham. Been through Beeham several times. Been to Beeham for uh, a couple of uh, shows and all that good stuff, or a couple of uh, uh, camps and whatnot. I do want to take a moment before we get into the rest of the show. I know we got a bunch of people watching tonight. A lot of you found us via film study. Okay, A lot of you people uh, came to the network, watched the network, subscribed to the network originally because you're like, hey, this guy watches a lot of films, got breakdowns, uh, breaks down a lot of films, got talks a lot of football. A, I appreciate you. Thank you. B, this is a great week to be on here. If you're never with us during bye weeks or when we get back from bye week, We don't have any game footage to watch, okay? So what we're going to do this week, we're going to take a pretty comprehensive look at Florida. Okay, so you're going to get a lot of what to expect this week, which is not something you typically get on a public 
uh, front. Normally, it's behind a paywall over there on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. This week, you're going to get a load of it right here on this network. Let's go ahead and give them three boys, three players to watch this weekend versus Florida. I'll go ahead and go last. Okay. Because I already told you which three I got, so I saved them. So, hey, in case you didn't know, there's a little favoritism towards the host around these parts. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I guess I'll go first. My first one's Dominic Lovett. I think he had seven receptions against Vanderbilt. I know. So, kind of like a preview of maybe what the offense will look like without Brock Bauer since you had the whole second half without him. Dominic Lovett seemed to kind of step up into a little bit of a prominent role in the offense. I think that there's a good chance that that continues. Malachi Starks, I think there's a huge opportunity for him to make some big plays against Florida this week. I think that Graham Mertz hasn't turned the ball over a lot. He has two interceptions on the year, but I think he has made some turnover-worthy throws Mm. that haven't resulted in turnovers. And I think Malachi Starks get him one this week. Not according to PFF. PFF says zero oh, turnover worthy throws, which I'm calling boo hockey because I could watch the Charlotte game and find three. I think there's two on the final drive against South Carolina. Yeah. Um, my last one, Warren Brinson. Murray kind of mentioned it. Shouts out 9-7. The, the, Florida, the Florida offensive line is not great. They're towards the bottom in sacks allowed per game this season. And so I think that Georgia's defense line, while they aren't a sack-oriented team, I think there's a chance for him to cause a lot of disruption, especially – against ETN and those running backs with theirs. So I think 97 could have a huge game. So first one I went with is Mike Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, give him three. What's up? Might be. So the first one I went with was Michael Williams. I feel like he could be a very big disruptor. We need one. Yeah. We need one. That's I, what I I'm do. saying. It feels Just, like he's kind of overdue. Due. Very overdue. So Michael Williams is one. Another one that, and this one's obvious, but Carson Beck. It mm. starts and ends with the quarterback, how he plays. And like I said, I've got a bunch of stats showing you how – Quarterbacks making their first targets for it doesn't really go well, so he can buck this trend and really have a big game. And then special teams is always a big deal, despite what you say. So I think Makai Muse can play a big role in this game. Just a stray right there, randomly. It, hey, you're always talking down the special teams, man. Um, let me ask you this. Who's the program in the conference that has uh, really, really prioritized special teams? South Carolina. Yeah, who's really, really bad at offense and defense right now? South Carolina. Okay, then. Um, here's, here's my whole thing about special teams. If I could say, hey, we're going to be good at one thing, the last thing you pick is special teams. It's the yeah, last thing you pick. I agree with um, that. I, special teams, hot take, not very special. Special teams, well, the, number one thing, right. the number one thing I will say at the end of special teams meetings every single day with the coaching staff is this, period. Let's make sure special teams doesn't lose us the game. Yeah. But if we have to go into a football game relying on special teams to be good for us to win, we've already lost before we go into it. I agree with that. Unless but, you're Iowa and you rely on them to win you football games. But if but you have, they'll never win important football games. No. That's fine. But if you have special teams that can add to a good offense and a good defense, it makes it that much more dangerous of a team. I'm not saying make special teams the emphasis of your team. That's stupid. It's not even a third of the game. It's like a, a not even a quarter. It's probably a tenth. But when you can have that extra tenth, it puts a lot of teams over. Correct. But I'm, I'm not – I'm not investing resources in how good or schematically or how much time we're spending on special teams because uh, I can be great at special teams. You know how I'm great at punt coverage? I put a bunch of five stars out on That's the field like Georgia. Okay, And now when, we, when it comes to games in January, we got to find a ways to win in the margins, and that's when we go, you know, really deep dive in the special teams unit. But this idea that we're going to spend hours on end every single day – Dedicating time no. to being great on special teams, a whole lot of waste. No, of and that's time. that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying Makai Muse is a guy who can be a game breaker. One hundred percent. If you have a 75 yard punt on Saturday, that's huge. Oh, I, I don't even remember what point you made. I just wanted to take a time. He threw to, a stray at you. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. I know you said special teams don't matter. They don't. Special teams are there to not lose ask, us ball games. Ask Philip Rivers that. Yeah. Well, Philip Rivers also had a bunch of really bad defenses. Philip Rivers also had a bunch of really unfortunate injuries. Not that year though. Okay. <laughs> just give him three. <laughs> just, just give him three. All right, give him three. Uh, let's go to mine. Here we go. We got uh, number one. I, I was watching Florida this uh, last night on into this morning, taking a litany of notes. <whistles> some really, really bad corner play right now for Florida. Some, some bad corner play in run support. Some bad corner play in the ability to attack and shed blocks out in the space out in space in the extension of the run game via the screen game. Some bad corner play with regards to 50-50 balls. Some just bad corner play um, right now at Florida. Also, uh, true freshman starting at safety, number 14, who I would be hunting all football game. All that leads me to this answer right here. Ra-Ra Thomas. Got to be a huge game. 
for Ra Ra Thomas and this, uh, you know, passing game at the X position. You want to find some X factors. You want to find some difference makers without Brock Bowers on the field. Hey, number five, probably one of those guys. Um, also noticed on film, something that you're going to see in our film breakdowns this week, Florida, horrendous at run fits. Like for a football program coached by Austin Armstrong, who I am a believer in, okay, will be a great defensive coordinator moving forward throughout his career, really promising football coach, okay, moving forward. They have awful run fits. And it's a byproduct of being really, really young. It's a byproduct of playing a bunch of guys. It's also a byproduct of just not being there a long time yet, okay? Not having been able to instill year over year consistency in the standard of run fits, okay? For that reason, Dejon Edwards, going to have a big game on Saturday, all right? So whoever it is, one thing I've noticed about Dejan, and one thing we heard Dylan Fairchild talk about this week, okay, or last week when talking about Dejan, he has the ability to find the guy who's winning, okay? And we've shown you this on film. It's not always about running to your landmark and just sticking it in the hole that's designed to, to, to be stuck into. That's not what running back play has evolved into nowadays. It's about, okay, we're running inside zone to the right, but now the left guard and the left tackle have really moved that three technique, so now the play's going back that side, okay? Finding that, finding the player who has not fit their gap correctly, that is what Dejon Edwards does great. That is something that Florida's defense really, really struggles with. I think Dejon Edwards has a big game this weekend. And a little birdie, a little birdie told me that uh, Jamon Dumas Johnson, or as we call him around here, Pop, uh, Pop may or may not have been like not 100% healthy at the beginning of the season and uh, got a week off might have a really, really good second half. So there you go. Uh, let's give him three. Now, uh, latest on Brock Bowers. I teased it all night, teased it, teased it, teased it. We're going to please it right here. I laughed, laughed in the faces, and you should have too, of any analyst that came out here and was doing any talk about, oh, well, maybe Brock Bowers played his last game in a Georgia uniform. If anybody was out here doing that type of analysis, you probably shouldn't trust them with your Georgia analysis moving forward. If you're listening to this network and listening to this show, odds are you're a Georgia fan. So if you found anybody out here questioning whether or not Brock Bowers is going to return, just don't trust him anymore because that person had no true insight on who this individual is. This individual in Brock Bowers is the mythical creature he is because of his work ethic. He is the mythical individual he is because of his personal character and how he goes about his day-to-day -day habits and his day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, go-abouts. And that's to attack everything in it 100% and attack everything with the, with the mindset of, I'm trying to be great today. And that mindset, shocker, gets applied to everything. It's the only reason he is the way he is, okay? Yeah, it's the natural God-given ability that God gave him, but nah, dude's an insane person. He works out and he works at an insane rate. He's attacked rehab at an insane rate. He will be back on the field probably sooner than most people thought. That is the latest on Brock Powers. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate and review. And what? No, that's juicy. I like that. That's juicy? Yeah. You like that? Um, you wouldn't need me to give you these juicy little teasers if you're over on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin and them's the facts. Okay. Um, you want to do a little concept set today? Let's hit it. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's get after it. All right. So we talk a lot. I mean, just like a shocking amount. Oh, the spin. We talk a lot on this network about offensive football, offensive football, offensive football, offensive football. We're going to talk a little bit about defensive football today. All right. Georgia, historically, everybody thinks they're a what? You think they're a man coverage football team? That's what people think. Yeah. That's what people think, right? Oh, like, oh they're going to go out there and cover everybody. Yeah, kind of. They do. This year, not so much. This year, they're actually kind of a zone-based approach from a football team's perspective. Now, a lot of teams that play Georgia are now spread offenses. Okay, A lot of spread offenses live out of what we call three by one. Okay, So they will put three receivers, sometimes attached over here, three receivers to one side. They will put that X back there on the back side. South Carolina uses this formation a lot. Ohio State is a three by one football team a lot, also a duos football team a lot. The idea of using three by one is mostly used by football teams who have a dominant X. We want to put him over there by himself and allow him to really get loose. Now, how has Georgia gone about playing three by one 
football teams, right? Let's attack three by one first. Well, they've been a cover six football team. What does that mean? Well, they'll take a corner out here. They'll play him, okay, with what looks to be man leverage. But in reality, he's playing everything underneath, and he's got help from Malachi Starks over here, who's responsible for this entire half of the field. If we were to take the hash and run it down, 24's got that whole half of the field. If he's got a whole half of the field, Kirby, what should we call that coverage? Two. He's got two. He's got whole half of the field. He's playing cover two over here on this half of the field, right? I told you the corner's playing up everything underneath, the safety playing everything over the top. Sometimes it looks like double coverage and bracket coverage on the number one receiver over here. Now, what do we play on the field side versus this three-man formation? Well, in this year and in years past, you've played a lot of cover six to this look. You've played cover two over here and cover four over here with the star right there and the corner, and that's right, another free safety over the top. The free safety has one quarter of the field right here. The corner has another quarter of the field right here. And the star has the flat out here. This is why you've seen Taki Smith make a lot of tackles in the screen game, right? Because he's responsible for this uh, curl flat area out here in the flat. Okay, so playing cover two on one side, cover four on another side. What do we call that? Cover six. Cover six. That a boy don't seem so disentertained over there. All right, so we got cover six right here against three by one. Let's talk about what they look like against, oh crap, two by two. All right, two by two formations over here. Let's look at it. Let's look at it at bunch first because most teams are a bunch formation. Okay, two by two team. Let's put the X and the Z on the same side because it doesn't really matter. We're going to show you the shell anyways. Georgia responds to this bunch look, which you're going to get a lot of this weekend with what we call a two by two, okay, shell, okay, or, or excuse me, a two high shell, and they play cloud out of it, right? So if anything runs into the flat, number of the corners got that, anything runs into the flat, corner's going to drive vertically and then come down on that. It almost looks like cover four, but in reality, it's just cloud coverage, all right? In, a, in other words, the corner's going to drive vertically if anything goes vertically, but he's going to read through number two, okay? The number two wide receiver, if anything breaks out into the flat, the corner's responsible for that. It's basically a way to play cover four, okay? Get, get, take care of everything deep while also making sure we just don't get berated with arrows out in the flat. But you're still going to give up the arrow out of the flat as long as the number one receiver drives vertically. You're going to see a lot of this from uh, Florida on Saturday. Now, how about two by two standard? Well, two by two standard is really the only time this year where they've kind of branched out and played more of a or more of a man coverage, okay, type of style. They'll walk the corner out here and they're really playing two man, okay? They'll walk the star out here over the, excuse me, not the star out of the over the Y. They'll actually flex the linebacker, put Malachi Starks over the top of him. They'll play up and under, okay? Up, over, and under the Y right here. They'll walk the star out here over this flat and they'll have another free safety in Javon Bullard up at the top. That's what we call two man under. If you play a lot of Madden, that's what that looks like, right? Now, what they'll also play out of this is a little bit of cover one robber. All right, they'll drop one of the free safeties into the hook and have a free set of eyes on the linebacker or on the quarterback and remove a situation where we have two deep safeties. Now, the real, I'm gonna mess with you, is on third and long. On third and long, because they have Malachi Starks, they have become one of the more multiple defenses in all of college football. So much so that I don't even know what they're playing half the time. Half the time what they're playing is, we're trying to let 24 play free while covering everybody else. Because 24 is the best safety in college football, and he'll probably find his way to the football, or better, he'll make them go away from him. So if he covers a bunch of the field on third and long, and they have to avoid him, Okay, well, they, they, they can't really avoid much or they can't really go a lot of places because he's covering so much ground. So shouts out to Malachi hey, Starks for making this defense one of the more multiple teams you in the country. You got my water? Huh? You got my water? Already? Yeah, after the show, I'll grab your water oh, then for never sure. Well, never mind. I'll, never mind. I'll get that. Random? I'm thirsty, man. Um, all right, so that is our show for tonight. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Hey, if you liked any of what you just saw, if you're new to this, Wait till we break down some film for your butt. Make sure you're subscribing, hitting that thumbs up button, like and reviewing, all that good stuff. We got a whole nother hour coming up in just a few minutes over on NBR. Make sure you're sticking around with us. Love you.